Superstars, by definition, are rather unusual people. So when you get to the most super of superstars, you have to expect the kind of weird and wild rumours that surround Michael Jackson. We don't touch on the pop world all that often, but Michael Jackson is much more than an entertainer. He's a symbol of the times. He hasn't given a full-scale TV exclusive this decade. So when, in the whimsical manner of superstars, he chose Australia's Ian Molly Meldrum to do the first interview and us to present it, we thought, why not? It meant putting up with an army of minders and going through more complicated negotiations than an arms treaty. The result is a break from our normal format, but we think you'll find it quite a colourful piece. And with that, we turn you over to our guest reporter, Molly Meldrum. All right. Backstage with Michael Jackson. As close to his private world as you could ever hope to get. People are always asking about the man behind the myth. But in this electric moment, is there really any difference? If you want to find out more about the real Michael Jackson, you start here at his magical launching pad, and let yourself be part of the illusion. voltage performance wired up to another world. The man they call Pops Peter Pan is in full flight. If there was ever a pure entertainment machine, you're watching it. Watching him on stage and the power of his performance, I remembered the shy kid I interviewed in New York for Countdown in 1977. Do you regret having to keep up with his schoolwork? No, I, I enjoy it. I love to read and learn and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, over in Australia, we've seen you on many of the big shows, like, like the, the, the big music awards and things like that. Oh, yeah. And your little sister's been on, on a few oh, of them. Oh, yeah. She's a funky little sister. <laughs> <laughs> she is She's funky. amazing. Um, <laughs> even back then, he'd already come such a long way. The son of a crane driver from industrial America, tripping the light fantastic when his friends were struggling in school plays, the boy who was born to sing knew nothing but the stage. At the time I talked to him, he was getting ready to rock with you. Ten years and tens of millions of records after. The song remains the same, but the singer has become far more elusive.
Waiting in a Tokyo hotel room, I still can't quite believe that of all the world's press, Michael's agreed to talk to me again. His first major TV interview this decade. Hi, Michael. Nice to see you again. But you don't get this deep inside the fortress without conditions. Strict limits on time, even the number of questions. I took Michael back to our interview all those years ago. You had a lot of aspirations at that time, a lot of dreams. Would it be fair to say that a lot of those dreams over the last 10 years, because it was in 1977 that interview, have come true for you? Most of my dreams seem to come true, and I'm so thankful that they do. Um, I don't know over what period of time, but I, I have lots of dreams, and they usually come true, and I'm so glad. Thousand fans on a warm September night watch Michael set music alight. Tonight it's Tokyo. An inkling of things to come when his magical mystery world tour hits Australia in November. Even if his music is not your style, Few can resist the Lord of the Dance. I dance a lot anyway. I've always loved to dance. When I was just real little, I used to watch uh, Sammy Davis, Fred Astaire, and James Brown, and just dancing about the house. So I don't remember not dancing. Like all superstars, Michael has to deal with a plague of allegations about his private life. Headlines which paint him as a weird recluse. Rumours about his supposedly mammoth plastic surgery. About his supposed fascination for bizarre relics like the Elephant Man. How much of it is true? Ask the question and you meet Michael's manager, cigar-smoking Frank DeLeo. He joined the interview as Michael's friend and chief minder. Now, about those headlines. Does it affect you? Does it hurt you to see some idiotic stories that are written? Yeah, I'll answer that question, if you don't mind. Uh, it hurts me. And if it hurts me, I know it hurts Michael. Uh, he's a little more blasé about it than I am. I mean, he just sort of shrugs it off. But I find it very terrible that some of the stuff that is written, uh, particularly about plastic surgery, and uh, it's mo the majority of it, uh, not the majority, all of it is garbage and rubbish. And, uh, you know, the, if that's the best thing that the, that's the only thing they can figure out to do with their life, then, you know, they're pretty sick people. Avoiding the spotlight off stage for this most wanted star requires some extraordinary escape routes. And in talking to us, Michael at least confirms one of those myths that he dons disguises to slip unseen into the real world. I like to sneak into theaters without being noticed sometimes. Um, sometimes there's really nothing you can do about it. It's the price you have to pay. Well, I've heard sometimes you, you turn up in the most unexpected places to your friends dressed in, but they don't even recognize you. I have incredible disguises. Uh, I, I can fool my own mother. and. Uh, I enjoy doing it because I get to see life the way it really is sometime, which is fun. But when Michael does step out as himself, it's an event. While in Tokyo, we were lucky enough to catch a rare glimpse of Michael's home video, showing a Jackson shopping spree. Together with a few select friends, Michael has a huge department store to himself. It's the same as uh, blowing no. it too. Oh, you can't, it's not the same as... Uh... You need about three years of uh, practice to really get the sounds out. When you're locked inside the four walls of fame and looking out at the crush of fans looking in, there's nothing quite as precious as one true friend. In Michael's case, that friend is Quincy Jones. They met on the film set of The Wiz. I met Michael at Sammy Davis's house when he was about 12. 
-hmm. And he just, you know, you just fall in love with Michael at any age. And uh, the whiz was when we really connected. Then he was a scarecrow and he'd pull out bits of paper, quotes with Confucius, etc., all these great philosophers. And one time he says, blah, 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 sign Socrates. And he kept saying Socrates, 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 and nobody would correct him. And after a while, I took him over to the side. I said, Michael, forgive me if you know, but it's Socrates, you know. And at that moment, our eyes met, and something happened that, that's never changed since then. Quincy Jones has produced Michael's three major solo records, including Pop's biggest selling album of all time, Thriller. Were you aware of the sales? That, like, did you yes. check up on sales each week and, and realize that it was doing this? Um, I pretty much did the album and just sat back and watched because I, it was another one of my dreams. I knew it was going to do what it did. Selling over 40 million copies, Thriller not only changed the way music was made, but also video clips. But perhaps one of Michael's greatest influences has been on dance. He took break dancing out of New York's ghettos and made it a passion for his generation. Did that amuse you that people were, or did it flatter you that people were trying to do your dance steps? And... I always love watching that, especially the children who when they wear all the gear and everything and and imitate me. I think it's fun. It's done in good taste, it's fun. <laughs> He's been called everything from the Frank Sinatra to the Fred Astaire of the 80s. The spotlight has made him music's first billionaire. All that at 29. He's uh, like a laser beam all the time. He always does his homework. I've never ever seen him nervous about anything. I called him just before he went on this show. This is his first solo tour ever. I said, you're nervous? He said, no, I can't wait to get on stage tonight. Clichés seem to fall away when you watch Michael perform. When he says he's inspired by things spiritual, you believe him. And when he says that four-letter word, love, you believe that too. Yeah, I, I love children and animals and Quincy and Frank. <laughs> Quincy. <laughs> and uh, that's what's so wonderful about traveling. I get to see all the cultures and people and the children. It's wonderful. It's my greatest inspiration, I would say. It was that sense of humanity that inspired Michael to sit down with Lionel Richie in the summer of 85 and write this. I was lucky enough to be at the recording of We Are The World, and even amongst the greatest collection of superstars ever gathered, all eyes were on Michael, the pitch-perfect performer who seemed to be seeing out a dream. It's true, we make a better day. I said I wanted to be something like an anthem where it would affect the whole world, you know, where everybody could sing it and have such melodic simplicity to it, where it'd be where a five-year-old child could sing it and like it, that type of thing. And uh, as I remember waking up from my sleep the next morning uh, before putting it down, really, most of the song was there, and uh, I went in the studio and kind of did a demo and presented it. And first, Quincy asked me to do it with Lionel, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I remember calling Quincy, telling him I had the tape. And uh, and then Lionel put some lyric to it. And uh, I, I hate saying who did what, well, but it always sounds no, so. No, something of interest, though. This but one. just when you thought it was safe to call Michael Pop's good boy, he comes up with this. Hey. 
The squeaky clean superstar who takes his rock and roll without the sex and drugs has called his latest album Bad. In a world where he could have cashed in on his fame overnight, Michael spent six years making Bad sound exceptionally good. I asked him why. Oh boy, that's a hard question. Well, first of all, you wrote nine of the songs on this album. Yeah. Um, it's just a series of collecting songs and writing songs uh, in my mind um, over a period of years or whatever. And uh, it's hard to say how one creates music because it's hard for me to take credit. Uh, I feel it's more spiritual and heavenly than I, I can't take credit for it really. Right. The Peter Pan figure bathed in blue light. Michael Jackson is truly one of modern music's enigmas. Some say he's a kid who never really grew up. But perhaps his friend Steven Spielberg had it right when he said, it's a nice place Michael comes from. I wish we could all spend some time in his world. If, uh, if you're given one wish now, what would you like? One wish? Yeah. If I was... I was going to say the fairy godmother, but I won't say that. If I could give you a wish, is there anything you wish for? There's so many I have, but one of them, one of the main ones, would be as uh, simple as making the whole world happy and world peace, and that is part of the reason why I do what I do. I like living this way. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.